<clears throat> okay, so uh, I realize this camera is coming in and out of focus, but I'm kind of constricted. I'm away right now and I don't have a Windows computer, so it's a choice either between having a video that goes in and out of focus or not having a video right now. Uh, but when I get back to the office, this will get better. Okay, so we got a, a problem here where there's an elevator with a mass hanging by a spring. And I'm going to say that this mass M1 is 4 kilograms. And the spring has a spring constant of, uh, let's say, 500 newtons per meter. And no, we didn't talk about this in class, but hopefully you found it in your book uh, using the glossary or index or whatever. So <clears throat> if you pull a spring from its equilibrium length by distance x and you multiply it by k, uh, that's what the force the force that you need to apply. Uh, so it's just given by the simple equation here. Uh, so in this case, the elevator's not moving, uh, and the first part of the question wants to know, you hang this mass on the spring, uh, how, how much does that spring elongate? Uh, and you can solve this with the free body diagram of the mass. So it's got two forces. There's the weight of the mass pointing down, and there's the force of tension pointing up. And we know that the sum of the forces on 1, which is going to be force of tension 1 minus m1g, is going to equal that mass times its acceleration, but it's 0 in this case. So this tells us that that force of tension is equal to m1g. Now likewise, we've got this other equation, which you looked up. Uh, you get that the force of tension that we apply is going to elongate the spring. And so we could solve for x. So it's going to be m1g divided by k. Uh, and we've got roughly, let's see, 4 kilograms, we'll say 10 meters a second squared, because I don't have a calculator with me, uh, divided by 500 newtons per meter. Uh, so this is 40 over 500. That kind of looks like four fifths. So it's 0 0.08 meters, uh, which is going to be eight centimeters, roughly. Okay, so that's part one. Part two gets a little bit more complicated. So now hanging from the top of the elevator is these three masses, one hanging down from the other one. So we got three identical springs. I think we're meant to assume that they all have that same spring constant as originally. So all spring constant k. Uh, and let's see, what do we want to know? We want to know what is the force of tension on that top spring, or on the bottom spring. So Ft3. Well, we can isolate that bottom mass and do a free body diagram. So we get that it has its weight pointing down and this force of tension pointing up. And uh, we get that the sum of the forces on three is going to be that force of tension pointing up minus the weight pointing down, and that's going to be the acceleration of that mass times the mass, uh, but there's no acceleration in this case, so that's zero. So we get that the force of tension in that spring, that bottom spring, is equal to the weight of the bottom mass. Uh, so some of you might have seen that, or, or reasoned, that those top masses aren't going to matter to this problem. Uh, but even if you didn't, if you followed these general rules, you'd get the right answer. Uh, what would this be? So uh, let's say you're given mass 1 is equal to 4, mass 2 is equal to 13, mass 3 is equal to 7. Even if I'm given these, I'm going to compute it all symbolically first and then plug in at the very end. Uh, and you'll see why on the next part we'll have this equation to work with. Uh, that we'll use instead of 
just these numbers. So let's see, this is going to be uh, roughly 70. 70 newtons. Okay. Now for part three, let's see. We want to know what is the distance that the middle spring is displaced from its equilibrium length. Okay. So how do we do this one? Well, we've got these three masses again. I'll just draw them all over. Uh, and what I could do is draw a free body diagram for M2. So I draw M2 by itself. I think about all the forces on it. So there's a spring connected to its top. And that is going to be the force of tension in that top spring. And you can imagine that I'm going to want this because I'm going to figure out x2 from the spring equation, Hooke's law. Uh, so that's one force. The other force is its weight. And then it's also got this other spring with this weight hanging down. So I'm going to call that the force of tension in spring 1. Well, the force of tension in spring 1 is given by, you know, we figure that, or spring 3, I should say. So we calculated that in part B. And look, I've got it right here. I don't have to plug in a number. I've got a general equation. So when I go to write the sum of the forces on mass 2, I can say this is Ft2 minus M2g minus force of tension in that bottom spring. And that's going to equal this acceleration of this mass times the mass, and that's zero again. Uh, and I know that this now is equal to M3 times g. So if I solve for Ft2, get M2g plus M3g and we could have guessed this that the force in this top spring it's holding these two masses so it's just going to be the weight of the two masses together now if I want to figure out how much it stretches by I've got to divide this by K so it's M2 plus M3 over G now let's see. I said that M2 is 13 and M3 was 7 kilograms. Oh, and then I've got K also. So 13 plus 7 kilograms. And what did I say for K? It's 500 newtons per meter. Oh, G's on the top. Okay, uh, and I'm going to have roughly 10 meters per second squared, so I'm going to make this a squiggly equal sign to say I'm estimating here. Okay, so I've got 20 times 10, that's 200 over 500. I'm going to check my answer here. I've got kilogram meter per second squared on the top, and I know a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared on the bottom times an inverse meter. So all these things are going to cancel. Two fifths, let's see, that's uh, 0 0.4 meters. So that's about 40 centimeters. Okay. Now for part four, Uh, this whole elevator now is moving downwards. And they just, well, we're meant to assume it's moving downwards. They never actually told us that uh, Y is pointing up. We could have easily just as soon uh, chose a coordinate system pointing down, in which case this would be positive. Uh, and then it's accelerating, so this rate of descent is decreasing. 
So if there's a positive acceleration, the positive y direction. And we've got these masses again. So mass 1, mass 2, mass 3. Uh, and let's see, we want to figure out what is the force of tension in that top spring. Well, we can break this down into separate free body diagrams. So I'm going to take that top mass and I'm going to break down all the forces. So there's the force of tension in that top top spring. And this also has its weight acting on it, pointing downwards. And it's also got the force of tension in spring in the middle spring, spring two. And if I move on down my mass chain, we've got the force of tension in spring two is now pointing upwards. This has its weight acting on it and it's got this spring pulling on it from the bottom. And then finally my last mass has that tension in the bottom spring and its weight acting on it. Okay, so first I'm going to use this. I'm going to say that the sum of the forces on mass one, and I just drew them so I can just write them out, Well, that's going to be mass 1 times its acceleration, which we're given now. So notice that the velocity doesn't matter in here at all. So if this elevator's going down at constant velocity, you're not going to know if it's moving or not. So it's only if it's accelerating where we have to factor this in. Then we've got the next one. So some of the forces on mass 2. I can just write these all out using my free body diagram. That's going to equal mass 2 times the acceleration and the sum of the forces on mass 3. Oops, there we go. Is Ft3 minus M3g is equal to M3a. Okay, well, this equation. I can solve for the force tension in that bottom spring like we did before. So it's M3A plus M3G is equal to M3A plus G. So according to this spring, it feels as though mass 3 is a little bit heavier or that gravity is a little bit stronger. And that's the effect of an accelerating frame of reference. So you've all felt this if you've been in an elevator. If it takes off, you feel temporarily heavier. And it really does feel like the effect of acceleration of gravity is a increase. So now we can plug this into this equation. So we've got the tension in spring two. Uh, is equal to M2 A plus G plus the force of tension 1, which is this one, M3 A plus G. So you might already be starting to see a pattern. Now we do this on, on uh, the top one. We're solving for FT1. That's going to be equal to M1 A plus G plus force of tension 2, which is this one. So we get M2 A plus G plus M3 A plus G. And so this is equal to M1 plus M2 plus M3 A plus G. And some of you could have guessed this um, intuitively. So the spring is weighing these masses, the sum total of these masses, all their weights, but in this new effective uh, gravity field or gravitational acceleration. Uh, so let's see, M1 plus M2 plus M3, what do we call that? So this was 24. And 
we've got 10. Uh, roughly 13.6, so whatever that is, that would be our force. Now for part five, we're asked, how much does that bottom spring stretch? And again, we'll use our spring equation, also called Hooke's Law, and we could solve for x3, if we knew what that force of tension was, uh, which we already figured out over here. So that's equal to m3a plus g divided by k. Uh, and finally, part six. Uh, a lot of people found this tricky, uh, but realize that the net force, it's asking for what is the, uh, how do the net forces compare, the total net force acting on each mass compare. So the total net force acting on mass 1 is just equal to all those forces acting on mass 1. And we know that that's always equal to mass 1 times the acceleration. And same thing for mass 2. Sum of all the forces on mass 2 is equal to mass 2 times the acceleration and likewise with mass 3 and the key to, thing to realize here is all these masses are accelerating at the same rate and so if we know how ma the masses compare we know how the net forces will compare and so in our problem we know that uh, mass 2 is greater than mass 3 is greater than mass 1, so therefore the net total force on mass 2 is the biggest because it takes more force to accelerate a bigger mass and the net force, that's bigger than the net force on mass 3 and finally all of those are bigger than the net force on mass 1. So that is how you would solve that problem.